Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host, CJ. If you saw my Thanksgiving Day thank you video, you saw me build this mini ITX PC, albeit at breakneck speeds. Today, I'm gonna disassemble the system and prepare to build it again. Now, bear with me, I'm not crazy. I'll explain right after. Let's get this thing pulled apart. Now, if you're wondering why pull it apart, it looks fine and it works. Well, this is why. And This is why. Now, the Inwin Chopin is probably one of my favorite mini ITX APU only cases to build in. It's super compact at only 3.3 liters. It's well constructed with this aluminum shroud that goes all the way around three sides. It has a built-in power supply and surprisingly, plenty of room for storage. However, at the moment, a, a whole lot of that room is being taken up by cables. Now, the Chopin is a 3.3 liter case with what seems like about 2.3 liters of cables. And during my speed build, I just shoved all those cables in this bottom compartment to get them out of the way. You know, like most of us handle cable management. Now, an out of sight, out of mind approach to cable management might work for some, but I'm not really cool with it, especially since I wanna put some drives in this case. So today I'm gonna to trim up these cables and make them more manageable. But the first thing I need to do is get them out of the basement here. So let's trip this case down a bit. I'll start by removing the aluminum shroud, which conveniently is just screwed on. And now the front panel IO assembly, it just clips right off. And now you can see how I just folded up the excess cables and shoved them into the bottom of the case. Okay, I'm gonna set aside the IO for now and we're gonna take a look at the built-in PSU. So this is a Flex ATX 150 watt, 80 plus bronze rated Powerman PSU. Powerman is a PSU used in a lot of in-wind cases and is actually a rebranded FSP unit, which is a reputable manufacturer. But to keep this simple, the cable pinout only includes the 24 pin or the 24 wires for your 24 pin ATX supply and four wires for your EPS or your CPU power. Everything else needed is just jumped. So you can see here that our SATA power and supplemental power is just jumped from the 24 pin ATX supply and you only have four wires two 12 volt and two ground going to a primary four pin connector and then your secondary four pin connector to make an eight pin connector for your CPU power is jumped from that. So if I pull pin one, you 
you can see they just, I think the correct term is butt spliced. I'm sure some electrician type person will correct me. I just call it jumped because after all, these are all just jumper wires. Anyway, this is an efficient way to minimize wires coming directly from the PSU, but because I'm gonna clean up this hot mess of wires anyway, I'm gonna change how we splice that SATA power in. So the first thing I'm gonna do is show you all the tools and supplies I'm gonna be using to do this job so I don't have to explain each one as I get to it. So the first, of course, is a good pair of wire cutters and I have these standard side cutters or flush cutters, just a standard tool in a PC build. Next, I have a wire stripper. I use one of these auto strippers because it's, it's easy. These can be a bit more expensive than a standard wire stripper, say like this one. But this one is actually pretty cheap. The length guide doesn't really work and sometimes the lock doesn't lock, but it does what it's supposed to do. It strips the insulation off the end of the wire with zero effort. Just insert, squeeze, and strip. Not too complicated. The next thing I have is a ratchet and crimper. I have two of these. The orange one is for ATX connectors and has a 1.5, a one millimeter and a 0.5 millimeter crimp channel. While the blue one I use for DuPont connectors and has a one millimeter, a 0.5 millimeter and a 0.25 millimeter crimp channel. You also need some type of pliers. A standard pair of needle nose works great. I use the ones on this. Also a very helpful tool that you just saw is this pin puller. I also have an X-Acto knife and a lighter. And finally, I have my soldering and rework station over here, but just a simple inexpensive soldering iron will work. Now for supplies, you'll need female ATX connectors for our 24 pin and eight pin EPS cables and some female DuPont connectors used for the front panels. I also have an assortment of DuPont housings and an assortment of some heat shrink. I'll leave links to all this stuff in the description below. Okay, I'm gonna start by shortening the 24 pin ATX connector. Now, I'm not gonna just cut off all 24 wires and lop off this connector because the only way I know the pinout of this PSU is because I know what each wire is based on where it's plugged into the connector. Once I remove the connector, I have no way of knowing which wire is which. Since it's a non-modular power supply, I'd have to pull it apart and trace each wire back to its rail and pulling apart a PSU is something I never do unless absolutely necessary and something I'd never recommend doing. So I'm gonna show you a trick on how not to lose track of your pinout. So the first thing you can do is simply do a one for one swap. Start with wire one, pull it out, cut it to length, add the female connector back on, plug it back into the housing right in the same spot. Now, this is the safest method and probably the best method to use in this instance, but I'm gonna do it another way, which works in every situation, especially where you're making more modifications such as, say, adding custom sleeving. And all you need is one of these closed cable combs. I'm just gonna use a Sharpie to mark where pin number one is gonna go. And then I can remove each pin and insert it into the cable comb in the correct spot.
Okay, so I got all the cables pulled from the cable housing. And since I can slide the comb along wires, you know, exactly how it's intended to do, I can get a more precise measurement on exactly where I want to cut my wires. So I have the motherboard and power supply set up exactly like it is in the case. Uh, everything fits very compactly in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna basically use my cable comb to measure the length. I'd say right about there should be good. That gives me some slack. I don't want it to be completely tight, but I can still get rid of a lot of wire there. Now, just a quick note, when you're lining up your wires, again, I marked pin one right here. And when you're looking down at your 24 ATX connector on your motherboard, pin one is the square one on the top left-hand side as you're looking at it. And it's one, two, three through 12. And then the rounded one below it is 13 to 24. So we make sure I got pin one lined up and pin 24, which would be theoretically my longest wire. Still got some slack in the cable. This is where I'm gonna cut it all off. I'm gonna cut slightly below the cable comb each wire because I don't want the wire slipping out and then lose my pin out. And again, then I'm, well, screwed. Okay, now I got them all cut. Now again, I'm gonna carefully slide my cable comb down farther. Just gonna use a little piece of tape to tape it in place just for some added peace of mind. Okay, so now I need to reinstall some ATX connector pins uh, to each of the wires. And I'll start with pin one. And the first thing I wanna do is grab my stripper and strip just about that much of the insulation. Now, how much exactly is that? Well, it's the exact length of the bare wire crimp wings of the ATX connector. I don't know the exact measurement as I've been doing this so long, I can just eyeball it, but this is the point where I add a great still overlay and edit showing you the exact length. Now, I need to prep the pin. There's as many methods to do this as there are people who do custom cabling. No one way is better. The absolute pros can do it in a single shot, just wire, pin, crimp, done. I'm not that guy. I like to get the crimp started so the connector holds on to the wire so I can make the final crimp without the wire falling out and me just losing my mind. Now, when I'm making custom cables, I'm using the same 16 gauge wire for everything. And this method is simple and repeatable. But this PSU uses an assortment of different gauge wires. So there'll be a little trial and error here. Let's first start with introducing you to the ATX pin. This pin has two sets of crimp wings. The bottom larger set of wings wraps around the insulation and bites in a little. The second smaller set of wings wraps around your bare wire making the electrical connection. This is also the crimp point that secures the wire to the pin, as the insulation is soft and can tear if it's the main point of stress. Stripping the right length of insulation is also important, as if the bare wire is too short, it won't get a good crimp, and if it's too long, it can slide into the opening and interfere with the male pin being able to be fully inserted. Now, Take a moment to clear that inappropriate comparison example from your mind. Now a quick introduction to the ratchet and crimpers. Each of the crimp slots on the tool are split into 
two crimp depths in order to crimp each set of wings on the pin to a different depth. The deeper depth is for the rear insulation wings. The higher depth is for the wire wings. The crimper also ratchets so you can replicate crimps precisely by clicking to a determined depth. The ratchet releases on a full crimp or with the use of the release lever on a crimp that's less than a full. Now, in most cases, if you're just doing a partial crimp, you're only going two or three clicks. And in that case, you can re reach the release lever to release the ratchet. However, if you go much more than that, it gets pretty tight. So if I have to release the ratchet at this point, I just use something like my pin puller tool or you know any other anything else that fits in here just to release the lever. So now to prep the pin, I'll take my crimper and hold it in front of me, pointing it away. Now holding the pin on the pin side opposite the wings, with the wings facing straight down, I slide the pin from left to right until that bottom set of wings catches on that lip in there that divides the two crimping depths. You'll feel it catch. Now you want to hold on to the pin firmly while, you are, while you're crimping because it has a tendency to rotate as you crimp and that'll just mess up the crimp. Now with the pin held firmly against that lip, squeeze the crimper slowly until it clicks one, two, or three times. Now, this will be totally dependent on your crimper, the wire gauge you're working with, and the pin size. These pins are for 15 to 16 gauge wire, and using the standard 16 gauge wire I always use for cables, I know if I click twice, it works. But what you're trying to achieve here is getting the insulation wings just started to crimp enough to hold the wire without crimping the smaller wings at all. Now, this will take some trial and error, but basically what you want to end up with is the ability to insert your wire into the crimp like this, so the insulation goes right up to, but not into, the second set of wings and your larger set of crimp wings to just hold on to that insulation enough so your pin won't fall off, just so it has a good hold. Now, what I'm gonna do is the same exact thing. I'm gonna take my pin, I'm gonna insert it into my crimper again in the same way, and this time I'm gonna go ahead and give it a full crimp. Now, with my standard 16 gauge wire, that's, that's it, that's all it takes. One crimp in the 1.5 millimeter slot and I have a good, full, clean crimp. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do a couple of these again to show you and then I'll cut away and finish because nobody wants to sit here and watch me do 24 crimps. So again, I'm gonna take my pin, I'm gonna slide it into my crimper, I'm gonna hold firmly and I'm gonna give this one three clicks. Now I got a good start to that crimp. I'm gonna go ahead and slide on. All right. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just take this straight into the one millimeter because I can already tell that it's going to need the a full one millimeter crimp here to get this good. All right, and that looks like it did it. Now, one thing you can run into, if you can see here, one thing you can run into, because this pin is for a 15 or 16 gauge wire, and I'm using a significantly thinner wire, when I did a crimp in the one millimeter, it significantly flattened out the insulation wings, which, will interfere with trying to reinsert it back into the housing, but this is pretty much a simple fix. All you gotta do is take your pliers and just give it a little squeeze and round it back out. And that's it, that's all it takes. Now, 
This worked really good. I got a good crimp. So again, it's the smaller set of crimps that physically holds the pin to the wire. Uh, and that has a really good tight crimp. And then for time's sake, guys, I'm gonna cut away. I'm gonna finish all these. When I come back, they'll be done. And just like that, I'm done. It actually took me about an hour as the assortment of wire gauges made it a bit trickier. So with all the pins securely installed, I just need to plug them back into the housing. But first, I need to take care of that SATA power cable that was originally jumped from the 24 pin connector. Now, I could have reconnected it just like it was before, but I wanted to show you how to do some inline splicing. But the first thing we have to do is identify which wire goes where. So the pinout for a SATA power connector starting at the notched end is the 3.3 volt, a ground wire, the 5.5 volt, another ground wire, and the 12 volt. We're going to splice wire one of the SATA connector into wire one of our ATX connector, 3.3 volt to 3.3 volt. And then wire two will go into wire five, three into six, four into seven, and then five into 10. And we're going to splice into the wires down here closer to the PSU and next to the pass through on the case itself. And that's it. There's a bunch more wire we don't need. And then again, what I'm gonna do to start this is on my SATA cables, I'm gonna strip off about a quarter inch of each of the cables, All right? So now my SATA cable is prepped and ready. I'm gonna start with wire one, which is my 3.3 volt wire here. And we're going to do an inline splice, meaning I'm gonna splice the power cable in line on this cable. Now to do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my X-Acto knife, which is dulled, but not dull, if that makes sense to you. And then with my lighter, I'm just gonna heat it up. And now what I can do is essentially melt through the insulation roll it around the blade around i can melt through the insulation of the wire without cutting the copper wires underneath okay then heat it back up and then make another cut about a quarter inch away Heat it back up. And this time I'm gonna slice across the wire. It's pretty simple, it melts right in. And then peel it right off. Okay, once I have the wire underneath exposed, I'm just going to kind of split those wires into two sections. We'll just make a split right in the middle of them. Just with my blade, just open it up like that. Now, I'm gonna take, again, on the notched end is my 3.3 volt wire. Then I wanna Keeping in mind which direction I want the cable to point, which in this case will be back towards that pass-through opening. I'm going to place that wire right through that slot I made there. Right. And then just wrap it around, twist it together. Okay. 
All right, now comes the fun part. I get to play with a scorching hot poker. Now, this is not a master class on welding. I am not the subject matter expert on welding. This is just to secure our splice together. And that's it. Now, once that wire cools, because remember, that's a copper wire. It's a tin-plated copper wire, which conducts heat really well. So the next step is to add a piece of heat shrink. You don't want to do that before you weld. Like, you don't want to slide the piece of heat shrink on and let it sit on the wire while you're, weld or while you're soldering here. We're not welding anything today. While well, you're soldering here, because that wire heat up and this heat shrink will shrink in the wrong spot. So now that it's cool, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna slide that heat shrink right over our splice there. And again, using my heat gun on my rework station, a lighter will work just as well here. We're just gonna shrinky dink that up. And that's it, and that's our inline splice. All right, now I'm gonna again slide my pin one right through slot one so I don't lose my pin out. So now I'm gonna cut away, I'm gonna do that four more times. When I come back, we'll get into the front panel connectors. Okay, so I've installed our SATA power connector. It's all spliced in. Now I can finally go ahead and plug each wire back into the 24 pin housing. So one at a time, starting with pin one. Now that we've shortened the cable and moved the cable, the last thing we need to do to the power supply is lengthen the EPS cable so I can route it around the inside edge of the bottom of the case and keep it from crossing over one of the drive bays. Now, this is probably the easiest modification because all we're gonna do is make an extension. Now, you can cut the cable and splice in a longer wire, but anytime you can avoid cutting and splicing power cables, the better. Now, I'm ashamed to admit that I'm a bit unprepared here. I have a box full of assorted male and female ATX housings, and I keep it in the same drawers as my DuPont housings, but for some reason I can't find them anywhere. I just happened to find one random male EPS housing, but I don't have a female housing. But you'll get the idea. So this is pretty simple. All I'm gonna do is cut a piece of wire to length, to the length I need. Then I'm gonna simply attach a female ATX pin to one side. and a male ATX pin to the other. Now the male pin is just like the female pin, but it has a pointy end and not an opening. So many jokes here that I'm trying hard to avoid. Okay, now with this EPS cable, you have the choice of making all eight wires and plugging all eight of these pins into an eight pin female housing or just make four wires and use a four pin female housing. Then jumping the other four just like this one is done here. I'm gonna do all eight wires because honestly, crimping a double wire in an ATX pin for that jumper can be tricky. I can usually get the crimp done with moderate effort, but then I can't get the pin all the way in the housing. It's just frustrating and I avoid it if possible. And running wires is pretty straightforward as the pin out for the EPS plug is pretty straightforward. 
the top four pins on the clippy side here are 12 volt leads and the four on the bottom are ground. As long as you run the wires straight through, you'll be okay. Don't cross the streams. Never cross the streams. Unfortunately, many of you won't get that reference. Anyway, for time's sake again, I'm just gonna do this one wire. If you wanna see me do all eight, feel free to rewind the video like seven times. But when you have all the wires made, all you're gonna do is clip them in the housing. The female pin goes into the male housing and then the male pin will go into the female housing that I don't have right now, but I'm sure you guys can use your imagination. And with that done, we have a cable extension and we've completed the modifications to this power supply. And unfortunately, I think we also have to complete the video and just call it part one. I hadn't intended to make this a two part video, but completely filling the SD card on my overhead camera just a few moments ago has convinced me otherwise. Because despite the heroic editing attempts I'm about to embark on, this is already going to be a lengthy video. So disregard how many times I've said we'll be doing the front panel cables along the way. I'm afraid I'll have to do that in part two. But if you read the title and the video description, which I haven't actually written yet, but I will, you already knew all of this, so you shouldn't be surprised. If you're watching this on launch, which most of you probably aren't, I'll have part two up as soon as possible, so make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss it. For the rest of you joining in days, months, or even years later, I'll have part two linked in the description below and on the end screen of this video, which should be popping up any second now because this is the end. So I'll close it out in my normal fashion and say that I hope you learned something. That, as always, is my primary goal. In addition to the forthcoming part two of this video, I'll also be assembling or, well, reassembling this mini ITX system, this time slowly and with commentary. So please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss that. And because it's one of the best ways you can support a small channel like mine. If you like this video, you know what to do. And I hope to see you in the next one, which I should because it's part two of this one.